Hey, this morning we uh, this morning is the first of three weeks uh, where we're going to begin to take a look uh, and continue actually what we started last Sunday. So if you're here last Sunday for Easter, uh, it was this changes everything. And so the next three weeks really are kind of born out of that. And, and so we're calling it the comeback. Um, and listen, part of what we're going to talk about is that it is hard for some people to believe that the story of Jesus conquering the grave and what that brings with it, that that can actually change everything. I love what Louis Giglio said. It should be at the top of your notes. He said, at some point, everyone needs a fresh start, a change of direction, a spiritual turnaround, a new beginning. Circumstances come up that are beyond our control. Sometimes we deal blows to ourselves, but there is hope. No matter what uh, we might be walking through, we can still have confidence that Jesus is the God of the comeback and that our story is not over as long as Jesus as in, is in it. So I just want to make something real clear right from the start, because if you've been a Jesus follower for quite a while, especially if you've been a Jesus follower for quite a while, you have to believe this because your friends who aren't real sure are looking at your eyes. And if they don't see it in your eyes, then they're not going to be able to believe it either. And if you're here for the first time, or maybe, you know, last week was the first time you were, have ever been here before, and so this makes the first time you've ever been in church two weeks in a row, thanks for being here, and I hope you can hear this, because we, listen, we believe you are never too far. Right? It is never too late. And our hope is that when we are at a low, God offers us a better way of living, a, a a way filled with freedom and a way filled with strength and a way filled with peace and with Jesus. So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about coming back from some struggles that maybe you've had in your life or are having in your life or a friend, a family member, somebody that you care a great deal about that they're even struggling with right now. And this morning, we're going to start with talking about addictions. I was shocked when Fox News did a segment, a week-long segment on the opioid problem in America, in the country, that the first place they started was Montgomery County. Check this out. America is quietly in the midst of the worst drug, drug epidemic in the history of the country. Tonight, we bring you the first installment of a week-long series called Drugged, looking at the story of America's opioid crisis. Slightly more than half a million Americans live in Montgomery County, Ohio, a place most famous for being home to the Wright brothers, inventors of modern flight. But it was there earlier this year that the coroner's office was forced to lease space at a nearby funeral parlor. It didn't have room for the growing number of corpses killed by opioids. That county's biggest city, Dayton, ranks number one in the country for drug ODs and is widely considered the heroin capital of America. In the state of Ohio, 3,310 people died of accidental drug overdoses in 2015 alone. That's more than the number of people killed on 9-11. Did you hear the way we were described? Heroin, heroin capital of the world. Listen, the idea for this series uh, began to come together this past fall. We were thinking through what we wanted to talk about this year and uh, it was last November that we lost one of our own members, Zach Gaylord. Uh, he lost his life because of his addiction. He was 31 years old. He started using drugs when he was 13, and quite frankly, he hated it. He hated who, you, who he became when he was using drugs. The problem was he couldn't control it. On your notes, check this out. Christian psychologist Gary Collins wrote, an addiction is any thinking or behavior that is habitual, repetitious, and difficult or impossible to control. And interestingly, God's word addresses this. Peter would write this, a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. So today I want you to meet someone. So Kyle, I'm going to ask if you would come on up. Uh, this is Kyle Shaw. He grew up here in Miamisburg, spent at least best part of your childhood here, and you live here today, but I wanted you to hear his story. Um, my name's Kyle Shaw. I'm 33 years old, and I grew up here in Miamisburg, um, right here at the end of Kircher Street. Um, growing up here, I grew up next door to some very influential people. Um, they were gang members, and they were into a lot of corrupt activity. 
So the bad boy lifestyle uh, was attractive to me, the fast cars, the fast girls, and the fast money. Um, so that was the lifestyle that I chased after. Um, I started smoking marijuana when I was 10 years old. Um, I also did not know my biological father until I was 10 years old. When he and my mother got back together, we then moved from Miamisburg to Riverside. Uh, up there, I have a half-sister, and her friends did drugs, so naturally they became my friends. And my occasional smoking marijuana here and there turned into everyday drug use. And then we experimented with different drugs, pills, cocaine, ecstasy, acid. By the time I was 15 years old, I'd done every drug there was except for crack and heroin. Um, I actually went to school with Zach Gaylord um, at Stebbins High School. And I used to walk in the front door and out the back and uh, come back for lunch to sell drugs and to get high while I was there. When I turned 18, I had a, a very rare type of cancer. And the type of cancer that I have was normally in like 60, 70 year old men's legs. And they couldn't figure out how it got in the back of an 18 year old boy's head. So they gave me uh, 10 times the amount of chemo that would a normal cancer patient. Um, and it was literally killing me. That's when I got introduced to crack cocaine. Um, that's how I caught my first case. I ended up going to the penitentiary over crack cocaine. And when I came home from the penitentiary, I had an uncle who lived with me. And uh, he was bipolar, and he'd have these manic episodes. And uh, he would get off his medication, and we could get him to the hospital and get him back on his medication. So um, I was going to the doctor, and I had a prescription of Xanax. So I thought if I gave him a handful of these Xanaxes, we could get him calmed down, get him to the hospital, and get him back on his medication. What I didn't know was that he was already taking methadone. And mixing those two drugs is a lethal combination. Um, so I gave him a handful of pills that overdosed him and killed him. Um, after that, my grandpa pulled a gun and put it to my forehead and said, you killed my son, I'm going to kill you. Only by the grace of God, he didn't pull that trigger. And a couple days later, I got high on those same Xanaxes, and I figured, well, he can't shoot me if he doesn't have any guns. So I stole his guns. Um, and that took me to the penitentiary again. And when I came home from the penitentiary then, I was addicted to pain pills, but the pills got real hard to find, and when you could find them, they was real expensive, and heroin started popping up everywhere. First time I did heroin, I didn't like it, but as the pills got harder and harder to find, the heroin got easier and easier. It became my drug of choice, and by 2011, I was completely strung out on heroin. Thanks, Kyle. And in case, and in case you think these are isolated stories, Kyle's story, Zach's story. Uh, check these numbers out. About one third of our population here in our country has a drug addiction of one kind or another, with legal drugs, illegal drugs. About 25%, almost a fourth of us, uh, is psychologically dependent on, on tobacco products. And alcohol is the second most used addictive drug in the United States, uh, let alone accounts for almost half of all traffic deaths. So what God says to us, Proverbs 5, sinners are trapped and caught by their own evil deeds. They get lost and die because of their foolishness and their lack of self-control. And just to make it real clear, he's not talking about someone else. He's talking about you and me. If you are a sinner, would you raise your hand? All sinners, raise your hand, please. If your hand is not up, your sin is lying, all right? Just to be real clear with everyone. So when God's word talks about this, he's talking to all of us. And here's what we need to understand. I think this is really important for ourselves, important for our friends to know when it comes to recovery, it's not really a destination. Recovery is more of a journey. It's not a place you get to. It's, it's a way you live your life. My friends in AA would never say I'm a recovered alcoholic. What they say is I'm a recovering alcoholic. And they recognize that they are going to spend the rest of their lives having to be vigilant in this battle so that they don't fall back into the same traps that they've been in. Recovery is a lifelong process. Anne Lamott said, you can get the monkey off your back, but the circus, it never leaves town. Listen, it seems appropriate to remind us first 
that our job as Jesus followers is to respond to people today the way Jesus did in his day and the way he still responds to people today. So I hope you can hear this. But God is in the business of giving fresh starts to people. He gives hope to the hopeless. He gives direction to the directionless. He gives help to those who need help. God is always good. His plans will always prevail, even when our plans don't. Even when our plans shouldn't prevail, His will. So if you or someone that you know a great or you care a great deal about, if you're caught in addiction, I want you to take a look at the top of your notes, if you would. Because we need to be reminded, you are never too far. It is never too late for you. So how do you make this comeback? If this is me, what am I supposed to be doing? If this is a friend of mine, someone I care a great deal about, how do I help them? Well, I want to give you some steps to overcoming addictive behavior this morning. And to be real clear, I'm not trying to be in competition with 12-step programs from Alcoholics Anonymous or, or Addicts Anonymous. And if you're struggling with an addiction, can I encourage you to check into those programs? They can be helpful to you. But to get us moving in the same direction this morning, just so we all understand this, here are some steps that you need to take. Number one, if there's going to be a comeback in your life, you have to really want to change. This has to be something you want. I know you've heard this joke. It's lame. I get it. How many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulb really has to want to change. <laughs> Terrible. This is horrible. It inflicted so much pain on me this week, I had to inflict it on you. Listen, <laughs> until a person wants to change, Everything else we're going to talk about is just background noise. It's a waste of time. Nothing good is going to come of it. And do you know why we're all reluctant? We all sin. We're all reluctant to change at times. It's because sin brings pleasure, at least for a while. You may not be ready to let go of whatever it is you've got going on because you like the ride for right now. But you need to understand it is not going to last and sometimes it ends up with a crash and a burn at the end. Earl Nightingale said, you will remain the same until the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of change. If you want to, listen, you've got to want to get past the problem, to get past the problem. Here's the second thing. I'm going to make sure you have this on your notes. I have to admit that I'm powerless over this problem. When an occasional sin becomes an addiction, it is no longer as simple as you just saying, I can quit anytime I want to. You've lost the ability to do that. The very nature of addiction is that you are out of control. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 25 reminds us that losing self-control leaves you as helpless as a city without a wall. In ancient city, in ancient times, a city without walls was totally vulnerable. Not only could advancing armies come in, wild animals could come in, anyone could come in. And when we allow sin to make us vulnerable, when an addiction lowers the wall, any other sin can wander into our life as well. Listen, admitting that we're powerless is a difficult step because it means I don't have my life under control. And we all like to think we have our life under control. And what are people going to think if I go see a counselor? What will people think about me if I check myself into a treatment center? What, if, what will people think if I join a support group? What will people think if I walk to the back of this room at the end of this service and I go back and I talk to Kyle? What will they think about me? So I don't, can't guarantee what anyone's going to think about you. But what I hope that those of us in this room will think is that, that you're a strong person and that, that we are glad that you are looking for help because we want to be the kind of place that gives people help. I hope they applaud your wisdom. Typically, instead of admitting our struggles, a lot of us try to cover up our addictions. And we're told in Proverbs chapter 11, the unfaithful are destroyed by their duplicity. If you try to fake your way through this, it's going to end up destroying you. If you're hiding some sort of addictive behavior, please don't wait until you hit rock bottom to start looking for help. Face up to the problem before it is too late for you. But you can't do that on your own. So that's why this next step involves surrender. I have to admit, 
I have to admit I can't do this. That's why Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. In all your ways acknowledge him. Proverbs 14 reminds us the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. It turns a man from the snares of death. When we show proper respect to God, when we show him we understand who you are and we ask for him to come into our lives, his Holy Spirit enters us and empowers us to make change, real, lasting change. The most critical step in recovery is making Jesus Lord. It's what that entails. Listen, what you're doing is you're turning over the deed. You're giving him the keys to your kingdom. You give them to Jesus, and you tell him that he gets to be the king of your kingdom. One recovering alcoholic and sex addict wrote, you will never overcome an addiction by willpower alone. And some people find that hard to believe because they think that Jesus is mad at them because they're an addict. Or they think he's disappointed in them. Or that he can't come anywhere near them because they're icky, and he doesn't want to get that on his fingers. Jesus is not afraid to walk into any situation at any moment. And anyone in any condition can say to Jesus, Jesus, I need you. I need someone to save me. I need to make a comeback here. And to them, Jesus will always, every time, without exception, say yes. So if you're struggling and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, you need to come clean with him. He knows what you're up to already. He just wants you to tell him. He wants you to be able to fess up to him and invite him to be Lord and then be baptized. Adam mentioned we saw two young men baptized in our first hour. You need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And for those of us who are already Christ followers, we need to every day surrender to who Jesus is and ask for his direction in our lives. And at some point, there's some people who are Christians who become uh, addicted to something that they come to this point where they publicly want to make this decision to rededicate their lives to Jesus. Listen, whatever it takes, surrender is what I'm talking about. Surrender is the key to victory. I told you that last year we lost one of our own. Zach was clean most of last year. He was going to meetings He enjoyed life. He was thinking clearly for the first time in a long time. He had a job. He had a family. On April 3rd of last year, Zach posted this on Facebook. He said, hey, everyone, today's the day I get baptized and start my new life with God. I've struggled with demons since I was barely a teenager. I've struggled with everything in life, matter of fact, since then. And now after close to 20 years, I've decided that I'm not the best person to be in control of my life. So I've surrendered knowing I can't do this by myself. So I've asked God to come into my life and take the wheel. My past is my past, and that's where it will stay. Today I will live life the best I can, be the best person I can be, do God's will as as he will have it. I couldn't have done it without you and without God by my side. And then later that morning, this is what happened. Good morning. So this is Zach. This is my brother-in-law. I'm so proud to be here with him. Uh, Zach's going to say a little word for us real quick, and then we'll go through. Hi, everybody. My name is Zach. Um, I just want to let everybody know that uh, I'm in recovery today. I have 40 days clean and sober, and I decided to surrender and give my life over to God. Every comeback story is a human story intersecting with God's story. And it is never too late. And you are never too far. You're never too old. You're not too far away. But you need to understand that there's more to it than that. You also need to take this next step, which is to avoid the sources of temptation. If you're going to make a comeback, you have to avoid them. If you are a recovering alcoholic... 
You may need to find restaurants that do not serve alcohol. If you struggle with gambling, may I suggest you not vacation in Las Vegas. If you have struggled with eating, do not go to an all-you-can-eat buffet. For some of us, it's our job what that keeps us enslaved. We've built these tendencies into our work where we've become workaholics. And so it's our job. We have to look for a different job. Or the frequent business travel. You find yourself in hotels by yourself, and the porn channel is right there, and it's just too much for you to avoid. Some of you here this morning are never going to break free of your addictive behavior until you change your friends. You cannot be the person that God is calling you to be walking beside you to be because your friends keep pulling you backwards into the life that you're trying to leave. I was talking to Zach's sister, Stacy. She's also a member here. She said that what happened to Zach was he got this job, which was great, but it, he was at work when he used to go to his meetings and he never picked up any new meetings. And then he decided he wanted to go back and see his old friends one more time. And three days later, he was dead. 1 Corinthians 15 says, don't fool yourselves. Bad friends will destroy you. You have to remove yourself. Avoid the people and the places that are going to plunge you right back into the temptation that has been destroying your life. You also need to be accountable. If you're going to make a comeback, you have to be accountable to someone It has been said that denial and secrecy are what keep an addiction going. And once we have the courage to express our struggles to someone else, we're way more likely to avoid those temptations because now we have another set of eyes watching us. Proverbs 15 says, healthy correction is good, and if you accept it, you will be wise. When we put ourselves into a situation where somebody else is asking us tough questions and making sure that we stay away from the places we need to stay away from and keeping us on track, we can remain strong. Not that it's going to be pleasant, because we also know from Proverbs 27 that wounds from a friend can be trusted, but they're wounds. I mean, I don't know if accountability sounds comfortable to you or not. Someone asking you difficult questions, very pointed questions, wounds from a friend. Listen, popular AA slogan says, you're only as sick as your secrets, which, by the way, doesn't mean you have to air your dirty laundry in front of the whole world. I don't suggest you put it on Facebook. You don't have to stand up here on a Sunday morning and confess all of your sins. What you need is somebody to talk to that you can be honest with and you can be transparent with who knows you and knows your life and knows your struggle and who will hold your feet to the fire. Here's the next thing you need to know because it's going to happen. You can't let occasional failures cause you to give up. I've read failure is not falling down, it's actually staying down. Proverbs 28 says, people who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. The goal is progress, not perfection. Listen, I'm not suggesting we lower our standards. I'm not suggesting that we excuse our faults. I'm not suggesting we act as if it's no big deal when we take a step backwards. What I'm asking is let's be realistic. Let's let's remember that recovery is a journey that we're on. And sometimes in that journey, we fall back a step. Don't let that stop you. Get moving forward again. Here's the last one. You need to be willing to help others who are struggling. This is part of the way God has wired us. When we help other people who have struggled with something that we are struggling with something that we have struggled with, that actually helps us. Proverbs 17 reminds us that a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in time of need. It's not a simple process, but with God's help, it's an effective process. That's that's what Kyle's been doing. So Kyle, if you'll come back up here and share with them what you've been up to, this is what God has been using Kyle to do uh, since he's made some changes in his life. Okay, so where I left off, I was still addicted to heroin. September 5th, 2013 was the last time I got high. So I have about three and a half years clean. Um, (laughs) I woke up in the county jail one night, and um, I was disgusted at what I'd seen. I grew up in church, so I knew of God, but I didn't actually know God. Um... 
I, I took a look at myself and I knew I needed to make some serious changes. And I tried to control my addiction. I tried to just do one drug or the other. I tried to just sell drugs. And I tried always to control this addiction and I couldn't. So I did the only thing I knew to do. I surrendered and I hit my knees and I prayed and I cried out to God. And I prayed, Lord, come into my life, live in me so I can live through you. And I said that prayer over and over and over for those 60 days I was in the county jail until I made sure that God heard me. Um, I came home from the county jail and I started getting involved. Um, I started volunteering down at one bistro a lot. That gave me a great opportunity to serve and it was a safe place. Um, I got involved with my home church, First Church of God. The STOP program comes there every Friday, so I was able to um, help work with them, and then eventually the pastor there started letting me share my story with him. So it, it really was crucial for me to change some people, places, and things, and to give back. Um, while I was in the county jail, God gave me a vision for Whole Truth Ministries. Um, Whole Truth Ministries is a recovery discipleship program. We have a transitional house in Riverside. We actually house five guys. Um, a lot of the guys are living there. They go through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. They um, do parenting courses, relationship courses. We use Right Now Media to teach those. Um, we encourage family members to get involved with families of addicts or Al-Anon. Um, we also have businesses that the proceeds from the business funnel back to support the transitional house and also the guys that are living there can get reacclimated to working. So we do uh, landscaping, we do tree work, we do uh, painting, uh, construction, pretty much any skilled labor. And I don't know, it's, it's been a beautiful thing. Like three and a half years ago, this was all just a dream. It was all just a vision, but today it's a reality. And um, I wanna read for you guys something um, oh, yeah, we're, uh, we're a 501c3. We're a standalone nonprofit organization. We're not of any one church, so we won't be limited to or restricted by any one church. So what you're saying is you're not just one church, but you're the church, part of the whole kingdom, as if churches that don't necessarily meet in the same building can actually work together That's to right. do good in Jesus' name. Yeah, Yeah, we're all a part of one huh. body. I just want to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, so I want to read this for you guys. One day, um, I had about nine months clean, and it just seemed like everything in my life was going wrong. Um, but it wasn't. I was just caught up in myself. So I knew that I needed to write a gratitude list. And I sat down to write one, and this is what came out. It's called, What's God Done For Me? I lived a life full of pain, brokenness, betrayal, lies, manipulation, broken relationship, broken homes, and broken hearts. I lived without for so long I didn't even know what I was missing. My false sense of pride and my ego told me that I was the man and that I had everything I ever wanted and needed. Society and the people around me validated my corrupt behavior. The bad boy lifestyle was all that I'd ever wanted and what did God do for me? I lived through an abusive childhood without my biological father the first 10 years of my life. I was made fun of and didn't fit in with a lot of the other kids. I remember stealing, lying, and fighting, trying to cover up who I really was just to seem like I fit in. I remember always searching for approval and judging who I was off of others' views. And what did God do for me? I turned to drugs for social activity, started smoking weed to feel a part of the cool crowd. I began to feel that drugs was who I was. I knew they made me feel better. I lived a life of pain and misery over drugs, the getting and finding means to get more, the sickness and withdrawal when I didn't have them, and the consequences that stemmed from all this, and what did God do for me? And what about when I was 18 and I found out that I had cancer, two days after I found out I was going to become a dad, when the cancer and drugs took me through hell, when I gave up my will and felt like life didn't even matter, and all I wanted to do was die, what did God do for me then? What about when I was in prison because of my drugs, the deaths of my friends, family members, and loved ones, and all the feelings of loneliness, inadequacy, worthlessness, hurt, anger, fear, sadness, and heartache? What did God do for me? Well, let me tell you what God did for me. He created me and gave me the childhood I complained about today. I only told you one side of the story. 
but here's the flip side. I was blessed with amazing grandparents who taught me and guided me until my mom and dad were ready to be parents. God gave me the talents to ride bikes, play football, and baseball. God blessed me with the ability to hunt, fish, ride dirt bikes, and four-wheelers. God used the abuse in my childhood to make me a tough man. God kept me safe through the years of drug use. Many kids aren't as fortunate to live through all the things that I did. My God gave me the strength to carry on through the cancer and gave me the beautiful little girl he knew I needed to provide me with just enough joy, happiness, and hope that I needed to live on. Just because my will was lost doesn't mean that his was. God gave me rest when I went to jail and prison. He delivered me from the lifestyle I thought was best for me. All the feelings God allowed me to feel were, for what I, were to allow me to feel what I feel today, an overwhelming joy and peace for my King Jesus. God allowed me to suffer to see my need for a Savior. What my God did for me was allow me to suffer while he carried me through until ultimately he delivered me. What did my God do for me? Well, that's simple. He gave me this testimony to share with you today. To him be all the praise and glory. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you caught it. Uh, I picked it up the very first service. Even though my will was lost, his wasn't. Isn't that interesting? God picked up his story and just continued writing. And so um, when we were getting ready for you to come this week, um, we believe that what you're doing is God blessed and God directed. And so uh, MCC wanted to give you a gift of $500 awesome. for what you're doing and helping folks out. No, thank you. Thank you. So here's the thing this morning, if you're struggling with an addiction, we want to help you. We believe that Jesus meets people right where they are. One of our core values here at MCC is that we believe faith is a journey, not a destination. And so we will meet people where they are, not where we wish they were. We'll go right where they are and we will risk getting our hands messy to help other people begin and build their relationship with Jesus. Because here's what we know. Life deals us blows. Yes. Circumstances come up that are beyond our control and obstacles keep us from living the life that we dream of. And sometimes it's not life. Sometimes it's us. We make mistakes and wrong decisions and we choose paths that are harmful, not hopeful. But there is hope. No matter what we might be walking through, we can still have confidence that Jesus is the God of the comeback and that our story is not over as long as Jesus is in it. Listen, if, if you've come today and you are caught, please let us help. Please let us help you with that. We've asked Kyle and, and his folks to be back at the back table, so they're going to be at the back of the room uh, if you'd like to talk to them about something you're struggling with, if you'd like to talk with them about something a friend of yours is struggling with, please pick up his information. And, and if that doesn't describe you, would you please just go back and give them a fist bump and say, you are the sharp end of the spear, man. Keep up the good work. We need to encourage them. Listen, we want to be part of your story. We want God to allow our stories to come together. And if you've come today and you've said, you know what, the one thing I, I've got to surrender to Jesus, we'd love to help you do that as well. Listen, why don't we go to God in prayer. God, thank you for who you are and thank you for who you've called us to be. Thank you that when we screw up our stories, you don't write us off. That you have the pen in your hand and the strength and the ability and the love to continue writing our story if we will allow you to do it. God, thank you for what you're doing in Kyle's life and through his life and those who have come with him today and God, what you've done in the lives of so many people here at MCC already. And for those who still need you to do that, God, I pray that they would surrender their lives to you today. Help us to be the place that helps people see you. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.